Not a day passes without pro-Europeans protesting outside the windows of Westminster. They are demanding that MPs do not forget the primary reason behind the European project, prioritizing the establishment of a long-standing peace. This was a principle established in 1946 by Winston Churchill himself. But even then, it signaled a very difficult marriage. Men will be proud to say, I am an European. We hope to see a Europe where men of every country will think as much of being a European as of belonging to their native land. We hope that wherever they go in the European continent, they will truly feel, here I am at home. We had not been on. Uh, we had not been uh, uh, defeated in the war. Britain alone had fought. There was not quite the same sense that we needed that solidarity and unity with other European countries. Churchill was right. For the British, their destiny resided in this young queen, Elizabeth II, crowned amongst popular jubilation. Meanwhile, on the continent, the Inner Six was set up, built around the Franco-German partnership. However, faced with a post-war economic crisis, the British government proposed the creation of a free trade zone before changing sides and asking to become a member of the single market. But General de Gaulle met this with scorn. Alors il est possible qu'un jour l'Angleterre parvienne à se transformer elle-même suffisamment pour faire partie de la communauté européenne sans restriction, sans réserve et préférence à quoi que ce soit. Et dans ce cas-là, les six lui ouvriraient la porte. I think he knew us actually better than some of the British politicians of the time did. And he, he said, look, this is a question of economics more than anything else. Britain is a country with global supply lines. It's a country with, with links of language and law to every continent. It, it is never going to be comfortable in a regional customs union. Voyez toute la presse anglaise ce matin, voyez les titres. Oui, nous entrons dans l'Europe. Britain's admission to the EU had taken no less than 25 years, and even then, it was easier said than done. Because if the conservative and very liberal Margaret Thatcher was going to play a role in Europe, she would demand concessions first. In France in 1984, at the Fontainebleau summit, Thatcher uttered one of her most famous statements, a little remark which you would think the Brexiteers had drafted. May I make a few comments first? One of the difficulties here has been to get clear the nature of the problem. We are not asking for a penny piece of community money for Britain. What we are asking is for a very large amount of our own money back. Il y a toujours cette notion d'appartenance partielle qui signifiait qu'au fond, il y avait aussi un problème pour les Britanniques. L'Europe n'était pas une solution, c'était une solution très partielle et c'était une adhésion qui n'était pas enthousiaste pour le moins. It was only in 1997 when the Labourite Tony Blair came to power that the country had become an enthusiastic member of the EU at last. Blair unquestionably accepted the principle of free movement. When the EU grew its membership in 2004, over 2 million Eastern European migrants settled in the UK. This was a massive migration of European workers which would play a crucial role over 10 years later in deciding Brexit. At the time, it was not a big issue. Because frankly, if you go into any centre of hospitality in this 
capital city of London, you will find lots of Europeans working there, or our health service, lots of Europeans, or our tech sector or financial service sector, lots of Europeans. We need these people. Alas, international crises came in quick succession for Tony Blair. Following on from the Iraq war, they weakened him until the point where he resigned halfway through his third term. Labour managed to hold on to power until the financial crash hit in 2008. The global economy was unstable and wars in the Middle East forced waves of migrants towards Europe. Such social and economic chaos gave rise to populist movements. In the UK, the Conservatives returned to power. But lying in wait was Nigel Farage and UKIP, his UK independence party, who raked in extra votes in every European election. I tell you what, the one prize I do deserve is the prize for sheer persistence because I stuck at it for 25 years, because I just believed it was the right thing to do. Threatened by the rise of the far right and far left, the Conservative Party panicked. To avoid losing his power, Prime Minister David Cameron promised the British public a referendum and opened Pandora's box. This political opportunism led to his fall, and what's worse, launched the country into political pandemonium. We will give the British people a referendum with a very simple in or out choice to stay in the European Union on these new terms or to come out altogether. It will be an in-out referendum. There was no public demand for a referendum. David Cameron called the referendum in order to resolve an internal fight in his own party. But once he had done that, he triggered uh, the most extraordinary deployment of media power, of, of money, uh, of international uh, uh, forces that were very hostile to Europe. In an attempt to gain an advantage, David Cameron tried the impossible to get the in to win. He negotiated exceptional measures to reassure the most Eurosceptic members of the electorate. But one thing throughout all of this will be constant, and that is my determination to deliver for the British people a reform of the European Union so they get a proper choice in that referendum that will hold an in-out referendum before the end of 2017. That will be constant. But there'll be lots of noise, lots of ups and downs along the way. David Cameron aurait voulu que le principe de libre circulation des personnes puisse être euh, renégocié dans un, dans un statut spécifique pour euh, le Royaume-Uni. Et là, je pense qu'on était tous d'accord, euh, la chancelière Merkel et moi-même, pour dire si vous voulez être dans le marché unique, avec tous les avantages qu'il procure, vous devez accepter la libre circulation. When he came back empty -handed from the renegotiation, I think people responded by saying, hang on, you know, we're the second biggest financial contributor, and this is how we're treated before we vote? This is how they treat us now? How will they treat us if we vote to remain? Uh, and it was at that moment, I think, that leave became inevitable. That was how the impossible marriage between the UK and EU came to an end. But it was also the start of an incredible desertion from politicians, leaving the British astonished and wounded. I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain that steers our country to its next destination. The next day, negotiations began within the Conservative Party to find the person who would manage the divorce. Boris Johnson seemed best placed. but caught up in power games, he also threw in the towel. Les tenants du, du Brexit euh, n'ont pas voulu euh, prendre la responsabilité euh, de la direction du gouvernement. Boris Johnson, le premier. Et ils ont laissé euh, Theresa May, qui avait appelé au maintien, non pas à la sortie, assumer euh, cette responsabilité. 
As the political parties tore one another apart, and the country seemed on the brink of implosion, the Queen had another trick up her sleeve. Just one year after the referendum, during the traditional opening ceremony of Parliament, she seemed to be dressed in European colours. A very royal way to wish Theresa May, the new Prime Minister, good luck for her negotiations with the European community. My government's priority is to secure the best possible deal as the country leaves the European Union. My ministers are committed to working with Parliament, the devolved administrations, business and others to build the widest possible consensus on the country's future outside the European Union. Just this once, the 27 member states of the European Union put up a united front. In response to the demands of the UK, Michel Barnier and his team are tasked with defending the interests of the EU. This mission will turn out to be particularly delicate. The Brexit negotiation is very difficult for Britain for two reasons. You know, first, trying to get the benefits of EU membership without the costs is a tough thing to negotiate and the European Union have not allowed that. But second, the issues around Brexit, about the kind of country we want to be, whether we want to be internationalist, whether we're pro-globalisation, whether we welcome immigrants to our shores, these are all crystallised in the Brexit debate. C'est le Royaume-Uni qui quitte l'Union européenne. C'est pas nous qui quittons le Royaume-Uni. Et donc, en quittant la maison commune, parce que le fonctionnement ne leur plaît pas, parce que ils n'aiment pas la Cour de justice, parce qu'ils ne veulent plus payer, parce que les réglementations européennes pour l'environnement, les droits sociaux, euh, pour les normes industrielles ne leur plaisent pas, parce qu'ils veulent une politique commerciale euh, solitaire plutôt que d'être dans notre politique commerciale pour négocier avec les Chinois ou les Américains. Euh, euh, ces règles-là, on ne va pas les changer. Mmh. 